So welcome everyone to the Boston Office 365 user group. We are actually going to do this through live broadcast, uh, just a piece of Teams. And uh, as you well know, uh, this is a little bit new technology to the user group. So we apologize in advance for any glitches that we may encounter. That being said, we welcome you to this and we will definitely be sure to have the, the video uploaded to YouTube, hopefully in a timely manner as well. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started really quick. Um, go ahead to the next slide if you don't mind. Excellent. So for all of you, we uh, um, the, uh, we the uh, organizers are here on your behalf to try try to bring to you um, some of the most exciting content as well as some of the most interesting content um, th that we can. We're actually thinking about start uh, starting to use uh, Microsoft Forms to actually survey in different topics and areas and things like that. So kind of being a look on the lookout for that as well. Um, that's something we've been noodling around. To. I just want to kind of give you a heads up. So Dimitri, uh, Mike, uh, as well as myself, uh, David Pelleggi, uh, we. <laughs> yes, please say hello, Mike. Hello, Mike. <laughs> yeah, so the answer is. Um, we are here here to help you um, as a uh, saying goes. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, if you don't mind. Awesome. So uh, we had last last month um, a speaker, uh, Scott Helmers. He was absolutely phenomenal. Um, of course, in true Microsoft fashion, uh, they happened to make some changes to kill his demo. But that being said, he was still able to show us some pretty awesome stuff around design and video and execute and power automate. It was pretty amazing. I, I loved a lot of it and definitely uh, had a lot to take. Uh, that is going to be uploaded. If it's not on YouTube right now, it's going to be within the next week. Apologize for any inconvenience that might have caused. All right, next slide. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike, and uh, Mike is going to go ahead and show, uh, talk about updates. Hey guys, so lots going on in the uh, world of Microsoft per usual. Um, just for uh, any of you that are new, uh, Microsoft tends to push out at a rate of about 200 updates per month. So what we're going to be talking about is by no means all inclusive, but rather just the top couple of uh, updates that we've seen that uh, we thought you may find interesting. So the first of those is a new SharePoint start page. And no, this is not redundant. There is, this is yet another change to the SharePoint page. I swear to you, this is new. Um, there's a uh, screenshot that is in, included here. Um, looks to me like the biggest, the most significant change is there's no longer kind of that quick launch sort of layout going down all the way down the left hand side. Instead, we have full screen width columns of news and sites, so we can view more news and more sites at a time. And then our featured links, recent documents, and saved for later items are all actually listed at the bottom. Um, one of the interesting things that I noticed on this um, when I was uh, actually grabbing the screenshots and checking to see if this was rolled out to my tenant, is uh, the recent documents now will actually display documents that aren't necessarily in that tenant. So it was showing documents that I was working on, actually namely, it showed me this deck, and this deck lives in the Boston, Boss 365 tenant, which is separate from my Wellington Street Consulting tenant, which is what I was looking at when I saw that. So this recent documents list had th had basically anything that was connected to, I guess it's anything that's connected to your OneDrive. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so anywho, 
that's a thing. More changes there. Uh, another new big change, I know that this is something that a lot of people have been waiting for, is audience targeting is now available. Um, not only is it available, but it's available um, to be applied to both uh, site and hub navigation and also the footer for modern sites. So this is going to enable people to specifically target groups of people. Um, these groups can be determined. Uh, one of the other things I found interesting about this particular iteration of audience targeting is it can be targeted to either security groups or Office 365 groups. <clears throat> so I know that's going to be a very welcome addition for a lot of people. And then another big one is there now custom customizations are now available for modern search results. So for those of you that used to customize uh, classic search results, uh, uh, myself amongst those people, um, we have not been able to do any customizations to the to the modern pages and have actually had to refer people back to classics for anything that's custom. That is now changed. Um, there's a blog post that was actually written by uh, Blue Bill Bear. I've got that linked down below. There's also a YouTube video which I have linked to in this slide um, that they did on this component. And I also included a real quick how to do it. It's actually really simple to do. Um, far easier than it used to be because they're just taking advantage of the uh, SharePoint online's patterns and practices parts. So you just create a page using those parts and then you go into the site collection admin, go to search settings and send your uh, custom, send your queries to a custom results page. So uh, actually pretty straightforward stuff there. Uh, if you guys, by the way, guys, if you guys have any questions about this, there is a Q&A capability in there. I know you can't just uh, shout things out at me, but uh, there is a Q&A in there. And if you guys uh, put something in there, then uh, David will stop me and uh, read that aloud for us. So by all means, put in your questions, comments about any of these updates. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say about the search results, though, is this is rolling out as a part of the Microsoft search rollout. And the easiest way to tell if you have Microsoft search is when your search bar moves up into the suite bar. That's the very top bar in Office 365 that actually has the waffle icon on the far left side. And is hopefully branded to your tenant because that's cool. All right. Next update. So this one, I honestly wasn't sure to make of this one, but I wanted, I definitely wanted to uh, make sure that I relayed it to everybody. Um, I found this in the uh, in the admin portal. Uh, it it looks like it's Microsoft just kind of tweaking some of the things that they're monitoring. Uh, I believe that this is happening due to uh, load balancing issues that are brought on by the number of people that are working from home, which has dramatically increased load um, for their systems. So some of the changes that they're making here are how often they check for people's presence, um, what interval they show when other people are typing, and also video resolution. I guess that's a silver lining on the cloud, right? Uh, to actually stress test Office 365 um, with yeah. everyone working from home. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's going to be a big test for Microsoft. It's going to be a big test for a lot of ISPs. You know, there's going to be a lot more load with all these people working from home, a lot more video conferencing happening. Um, 
I've noticed it myself. Uh, Seth had mentioned that he had noticed it earlier. Um, so yeah, it's <clears throat> it's an interesting time to be in IT. So, all right. And our last feature, I think is one of the most exciting ones, and this is one that uh, that uh, Dimitri brought to my attention, and I was super excited to learn about this, is OneDrive is now going to be synchronizing version history. So any of your documents that are being synced by ver with uh, uh, OneDrive, if the as long as your document library is enabled for version control, which it would be by default, then that version control capability is now going to be available on the device locally that um, that it is synced to. Uh, this capability is going to exist for both Windows and Mac users. Um, I think this may be one of the first times I've seen something like this rolled out to both Windows and Mac users at the same time. That's pretty cool. Um, I, I just love not having to qualify that. That's super unique and very, very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, so this capability is going to be rolled out in mid-March. Uh, I checked for this as soon as I learned about it, and I do not have it. My, my tenant is set for uh, targeted release and uh, hasn't hit mine yet, so should be any time now. They expect that it's going to be completed by the end of uh, by the end of March, so I guess that's going to be moving pretty quick. And uh, that's it for updates. Do we have any questions on any of those updates before we move on to the next I'm slide? Currently looking at the Q and A, and most everyone was uh, just. Um, basically crying about the fact that uh, there's no virtual pizza um, in the lobby. But <laughs> that, that is deeply upsetting. Um, however, Microsoft has not made that feature available to us yet. But, you know, as soon as they do, we will jump on that. There's always Uber Eats. What's that? Oop. There's always Uber Eats. Uber <laughs> Eats, that's right. True enough. That's right. Get your own damn pizza. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I, I think I think Uber Eats should be paying us uh, for uh, broadcasting this. Uh, that, that's, that's free right. publicity right there. That's right. Can't be having that. <laughs> but instead of this being brought to you by Uber Eats, we are actually brought to you by Turn Digital. So thank you, Turn Digital, for your support for this month's session. Um, and while, while that did not involve pizza, it does still involve a lot of overhead and a lot of uh, work that goes into uh, keeping these sessions up and running. So we do appreciate that. And uh, with that, I am going to hand it back over to Mr. Pleggy. Awesome. So at the moment you've all been waiting for, um, as the saying goes, to give you some background, I have known Seth, Seth Maislin for over five years, I think almost six years now. Um, I worked with him at Early Information Science a long time ago in a land far, far away. He is by far one of the most awesomest people I know. Um, considering he's a taxonomist, he has the, one of the best sense of his, uh, senses of humor, unlike the, all the jokes you can add with librarians and such. Um, he's absolutely phenomenal, and I know you guys have all come for the light bulb joke. I get it. I don't blame you. I'm the whole reason why I'm here is to hear the light bulb joke myself. Outside, <laughs> outside of that, uh, he is going to be going through Office 365 informational management and using people. Yeah, everything's fine. You have the best solution in the world, but let's face it: as soon as you throw people in the mix, guess what? Things tend to go sideways and south really quick. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Seth Maislin. Go ahead and don't forget to unmute yourself, Seth. That would help. Yeah, you all missed the light bulb joke. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, and I guess with that, I should take over the sharing and and 
move on to my materials and introduce myself and all that? Please do. OK, let's do that. OK. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the challenges of having to do this from home. You know, you might not be used to it. Uh, I usually end up working at home, but this is still a bit of an adventure. So I just want to say, you know, thank you for coming along the ride with me. Uh, I did, I presented uh, with the O365 friends a couple of years ago, uh, which was kind of my introduction to this group and um, kind of stepped away for a little while and I decided to come back. It's been too long, so thank you. Um, I, I want to start uh, by basically making sure that we're all relaxed. It's a tough time in the world right now, so I'd like everybody to enjoy some baby animals for a minute. Um, this is just a reminder that nature is still a good place <laughs> and there's a lot of good stuff about it, uh, even as uh, we're stuck inside. Um, but what I what I really want to do is, is uh, uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and I'm going to leave some time for questions and so forth as we go forward. Um, so who I am, uh, I've got a LinkedIn profile that's probably got more information than I felt like putting onto the slide. Uh, basically, I specialize in data and information governance, which includes things like taxonomy and data modeling, um, but also the human side of it. So you can design a great solution and a wonderful taxonomy and people still have to tag and still have to design in a way that uses it and you know have to comply to the guidelines. And so that's really where I think of the smackdown of this presentation is coming in. Um, it is that challenge of knowing it works on paper, but not necessarily knowing it works in real life and finding a way where they where they meet. Um, I've been an independent consultant for, a you know, a, uh, uh, not that long. Uh, I was with Early Information Science not that long ago. It's where I met David. Uh, I left there last year but continue to work with them as a consultant. In fact, I'm working on projects with them and the case study that I'm presenting here comes from some of that work. So it is sort of a shout out to Early Information Science um, and the work that, that they did that I'm able to present this. So I've been around for a while. I did throw in there that I'm a, a barbershop singer. It's very difficult to do barbershop uh, over Skype and uh, over Teams. It, it doesn't work very well. The tuning is a little off. Um, so I'm hoping that I can get back to that as soon as I'm you know, allowed to get back outside. Uh, if you've got other questions, want to know more about me, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to share. We'll have the Q&A open throughout. Uh, You'll notice that I didn't say anything about SharePoint in my introduction because I don't think of myself as a SharePoint guy. I think of myself as on the information and the data side. So I kind of think of like this, you think of the, the governance know-how is kind of you know where I am. Uh, and I think of you guys as coming in from the O365 side. Uh, and my challenge is to come up with a presentation where they overlap. Um, my uh, disclaimer up front is that I don't claim to know a whole lot about O365. I know a little bit specifically around the spaces where we're looking at making the governance work, the taxonomy and the term store and the schemas and the models and some of the search. Uh, but for the most part, I would not be surprised as I as I never am when I work with you guys uh, here is that there's a lot about SharePoint that I know nothing about and I don't pretend to know a whole lot about. So uh, I am a little intimidated. I'm a little nervous. Um, so what I'm hoping really is that you guys keep me honest. So if there's a question or something that I say that needs refinement or I'm not saying it in a way that sort of appear, appeals to all you guys, um, let me know. And I also invite some of the other folks here to jump in and help me clarify if I kind of step in it. <laughs> But in the meantime, what I can talk about is this governance side, this actual people thing. So when we think about governance in a loose sense, uh, I like to think of the happy path. Basically, this is people collaborating and talking about it. It's getting together in a room and whiteboarding. It's 
having the right hand know what the left hand is doing. It's having meetings at a cadence that seems to work for most people and having meaningful discussions. And if you are in any way cynical, uh, you're probably frowning at this point because as you know, in reality, um, that is a little too happy path. Um, the closest you're going to get to a meeting like this in most environments is because everybody is forced to talk to each other, not because they wanted to be there. Uh, the way that I tend to think of governance in real life is sort of this picture here. Uh, so these are penguins. And if we're going to uh, describe this world, uh, I would basically say that all of these are the users. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, then who, who are these two penguins? <laughs> so I think uh, this one is the steward. That's your taxonomist. That's your information manager. Uh, their job is to sort of stand there at the gate and somehow control the masses. Uh, and there are a lot of tools that we're going to talk about that the steward has. And I was thinking about, well, who's this other penguin with their back turned? And sometimes I think that's IT. So uh, as the steward, as someone who often represents the steward, I sometimes think of myself in this really odd position where I have to find a way to coordinate the users so that they're able to manage their business, get the most out of their information, work together, uh, be cooperative and collaborative and productive. But at the same time, uh, you can't exactly ignore the fact that you're using technology that has limitations, that has specialized resources, that has people who really understand it uh, and can speak to it. Um, in the typical stereotype right it and the business are sometimes at odds and i actually don't think that's a bad thing i think it's okay to have competing priorities at which point the steward in a way is kind of in between um it's unclear from this picture whether the steward is advocating for it and or is collaborating with the business and i think the answer is it's kind of both um so when i think of governance from this situation this is kind of what i want to talk about so we know that there is a series of restrictions and features both that are provided in the O365 environment, but we recognize that there are a lot of users who have to find a way to do this. And so this particular story uh, is interesting because it's really trying to, sorry, actual people, uh, where, where we're actually trying to work on here is finding a way to get people who don't normally work together or who are trying to work together in an environment that may or may not be getting in their way. Uh, and so this is a particularly interesting story. Um, so what I'm hoping is that as you go through this and you think about your own situation, you think about some of your own challenges, I wanna kind of look at this somewhat extreme case uh, in the hopes that some of it resonates with you guys and you think, oh, I get it. Okay, I see how this could work or how it's not working. Um, and so I, I, I refer to this as a smackdown in three rounds. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to address kind of the three legs of the stool, if you will, uh, in terms of what it's going to take to make this work. And the, the, the three legs really are dealing with the term store, or if you will, the terms, the words, the, the keywords, the taxonomy, uh, the metadata. Uh, and then the second one is really dealing with the modeling. So how are you working with your content types? How are you getting people to work together, content types being a really foundational piece, as you know, to O365. And as if that isn't enough, one thing that I'm not speaking about here, I don't know enough about it, um, but I understand that the whole concept of the content type hub is on shaky ground these days, um, that there's concerns about whether or not it will continue in its current form. Uh, if it were to be removed or replaced. I think PNP is one of the things that they've talked about. And just saying PNP makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about. I, I, I don't, but I'm still think in terms of content types. And if even if it's not content types, I think about that sense of when you talk about something, are you talking about the same thing in the same way? And that's really the issue when I think about content types, whether it's in that form or not. And then the last comes into the governance. It's really the change management piece. And so those are the, the, the three rounds. So here's what makes this particular case study a little more intriguing than others. It's one thing to argue about the taxonomy and say, I like these words, but she likes these words and how are we gonna work together? It's the same thing with the content types. But what made this particularly challenging is we're talking about an organization that is essentially a lot of organizations and all of the organizations are independent. So this is not like you have a central power 
that is running the show and all the business is sort of screaming and banging on the door saying, I don't want to do it this way. I want my thing. You're not letting me do my thing or straight out reversing that where all of the business is just running their own show and the global organization is trying desperately to get them in line and keep things consistent. Um, here we actually are talking about different organizations. It's the way that this particular organization is built uh, legally. So if you were to imagine that these were completely different organizations that were all trying to work together, right? Think of it almost like franchises, if you will. So if each McDonald's had their own SharePoint and then there's McDonald's as a whole that had its SharePoint and somehow the global McDonald's is trying to get all of the franchises to do stuff, but has no real authority over the franchises whatsoever, which is you can see the franchise model doesn't work. Right now, global can make all the franchises do whatever they want. Uh, imagine you can't. Everyone's just gone off and done their own thing. So global has this desire for universal findability and sharing, right? They want everybody to work together. They want to be a one company. Uh, they also recognize the value of having the individual local companies. So the US company, the Canada company, the Australian company. I'm just going to use that as sort of the metaphor here. They all want them to work together. We can all learn from each other. So the idea that something could happen in the US that Canada can learn from or vice versa, or that there's opportunities for Canada and the US to work together about something, um, all of that is great and is really important and valuable. And everybody agrees at the local as well as the global level. Yeah, that's great. But global is the only organization that really is trying to make it happen. And the local organizations, it's a little bit more like lip service because the truth is, is the United States and Canada and Australia and the UK are primarily interested in their customers, in their contexts. Right. I want to do it the US way because I'm in the US. Um, and while I appreciate what the other countries are doing, that my countries are in the US, we're governed by US governance, by the laws, by the customers, by the language, by the way we think about our industries, by our mental models. And so, yeah, sure, occasionally I would love to go out and look around and see what other countries are doing. But in the end, if it doesn't work for us, we're not going to do it. And so you've got this uh tension which is a very real tension uh there's one other piece in this particular problem which is worth noting and that is that the largest groups have run on ahead and done a lot more than the smallest groups so there's very much a sense of have and have nots the united states for example is more mature has more resources has more money and has been doing things a lot longer for more people and is that much less likely to allow some external force to come in and say, you know what you should be doing, as opposed to smaller countries or new parts of the businesses, right? Brand new franchises that are happy to get any help that they can. They don't have the resources. They don't have the experience. They're starting from scratch. So in a nutshell, right, you've got this global team who wants to maximize capabilities for everybody across all the organizations, but each local team is prioritizing its own business. And every local team is different in a really important way. So the question is, how is the global team going to achieve much, let alone anything, if A, it has no authority over the individual teams, and B, any impositions could actually trigger an unwillingness to cooperate. So it isn't enough to say, hey, we'd really like to make a suggestion. You have to say it in such a way that if that suggestion is in any way going to step on somebody's toes, is going to offend them, is going to be bad timing, is going to be too expensive, feels like too much work, feels like I don't, you don't understand, you're not listening to me. Um, you could essentially have that local team shut you out completely. Like, I'm sorry, you've lost all credibility, that's the end. So here we are trying to represent this global organization. We are trying to do O365 information management but we're doing it in a very diverse environment where our actual people are going to be a problem if we can't figure out a way to make it work. And so let's look at this round one terminology. Uh, I have, by the way, I, I have been doing this without having the, uh, the Q&A open. If there's Q&A, uh, David or somebody, if there's something that comes up and you want to jump in by all means, uh, just interrupt and let me know. I will definitely do that for you. Uh, so okay. far, so good. I, th I right. think you got them captivated. <laughs> Either that or they are paying the pizza delivery guys who have all shown up at exactly the same time. It seems like pizza should have bandwidth problems too, but I, I've never known them to have bandwidth problems. So here is a bit of a hypothetical. 
So let's say that our organizations are divided up by countries. We're here, we have country A, B, and C, and they are each trying to manage, in fact, they're already managing vocabularies that are generally referring to the industries. Um, so you'll notice that country A and country B uh, refer to industries already in a slightly different way. I, one of them uses the plural, one of them uses the singular. If you wanna really get into best practices over which one is correct, I'm happy to go down that rabbit hole with you. Um, but the truth is, is they both work. Industries and industry, singular, plural, or a sector. Country B is clearly making a distinction between an industry and a sector, something that none of the organ other organizations appears to be doing. They might argue that those are synonyms. Uh, and then they've got their own terms. So take, for example, in country A, you'll notice they have energy as a top level and energy services as something underneath. You can see how that's different depending on who you're talking to. Um, but you are dealing with some key uniquenesses that may not just be a question of each group went off and did it in a vacuum and came up with what they thought was the right idea. Uh, so take, for example, country A has forest products. Nobody else has forest products. Well, there's, there's a reason for that. Country A actually cares about forest products. That's a thing for them. And countries B and C don't. So if I go with the analogies, that could be Canada because of a very large you know, forestry industry and the fact that maybe they do a lot of work in forestry. Uh, in comparison, country C has renewables. Nobody else seems to have renewables, or at least not obviously so. So again, country C has its own needs. This is part of the existing problem. The idea that I'm going to combine all of it and create one giant list is all well and good. But what are you going to do with forest products? Does everybody have to have forest products showing up? And if so, and they don't care about it, how do they turn it off? Or how is, isn't that annoying? And keep in mind that we're not talking about three countries. We're talking about, you know, with these local organizations, you could have 10, you could have 20, you can have 50. And if everybody has their uniquenesses and they all get shoved together, you've got one heck of a taxonomy problem. Now, to be clear, this kind of taxonomy problem is typical. If you've ever been in an organization where you're trying to get the silos to work together, you're going to have these kinds of struggles. How do you take tree, you know, the tree from one country and combine it with the tree from another one? And do the words even mean the same thing? Um, so this is to some extent typical, but just remember underneath any change you attempt to make is going to be a significant imposition from an outsider, not an insider. Um, there are some other challenges. Like I said, there's industry versus sector. Uh, there's the way things have been organized together. So you have mining shows up uh, for everybody, but country C says mining and natural resources. Natural resources for country B is at the top level, but somehow doesn't appear in any of the subs. So what exactly is a natural resource? You start getting into questions of do they even mean the same thing, let alone should we combine them? Uh, and there's a little comment here. You'll notice that chemicals have been added up at the top level for country C. And as we all know, you have to be very careful when you mix chemicals. So we need to be careful about trying to combine these. And just to be clear, right, this is one area of conflict. Right. So other areas that might be familiar to you take, for example, uh, just in industries alone, you know, the role of government. So if we really are working with countries here, recognize like how, where does healthcare go? Well, it depends. Is healthcare a government function or is it not a government function? So things like healthcare, utilities, transportation, logistics, education, these may or may not be public functions. So even if you wanted to combine them together, it could be really difficult because those combinations could just be straight out wrong for the contexts that you're in. And again, I'm just using this as an example where we're looking at industries. So the types of challenges that you're looking at with just this list, and keep in mind then there's, you know, what services do you provide? What brands do you manage? What products do you sell? What kinds of roles do you have in the organization? How do you describe your customers? How do you describe your customer environments? Every single one of these how do you manage it? How do you get people working together? And so in this particular situation, what's happening is that all of these organizations who have been building their own share points are now being asked, hey, O365, let's share. Now we could, in theory, put everybody's lists into their own space inside O365 and have everybody continue to work for the most part independently. There are gonna be some serious governance challenges if you do that. How do you manage the permissions of who can do what? Um, but let's assume we're really trying to get them to use one list as much as possible. So we've got, as you saw, issues with names, issues with meanings, issues with groupings, 
um, and issues with parents. You can have similar ideas that mean the same thing, but have different parents. As in the government example, you could put education or healthcare as a government function or not, depending on how you describe your business. So the global organization is looking at this and saying, all right, here's the way we break this down. We want to acknowledge when there's overlap that we can control the overlap. So if healthcare means healthcare to everybody, we want to create one healthcare that they can all share. And you could say why. So in case you haven't figured out why we're trying to do this, right? It's things like search. It's really around findability is a great example. If I were to look at a global search and by global, I mean, I'm looking across all of these local organizations and I want to find everything related to healthcare. Well, some people call it healthcare as one word. Other people call it healthcare services as two words. Someone else calls it healthcare services as three words. And you run into a problem where these words don't mean the same thing. SharePoint doesn't think they're the same thing. They don't have the same ID. Uh, and so they don't combine. They don't sort correctly. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've seen things, you know, bucketed, where the buckets all look the same, but the content underneath each bucket is different, you know what I'm talking about. So how do we deal with the overlap? So can we all agree on healthcare? Can we all agree on what we mean when we say oil and gas? Well, what about coal? Okay, oil and gas and coal. Well, we don't do coal. Okay, so it's oil and gas. And so you're fighting over this. So that's where you deal with this sort of non-overlap freedom. So only one country has forestry. I don't want forestry to go in everybody's list. I don't want them to tag with forestry. We own it, we're doing our own thing, but we don't wanna block it. So we don't wanna say, hey, 80% of the people don't talk about forestry, so we're not gonna include it, is a really dangerous choice. So how do we enable the uniqueness that's necessary so that people can customize their results. And then the, the other way we thought about it, I'm sort of here put it in quotes, is, is skins. So when there's local variation, how do we manage that? So think of this in the case of sorting. So if I want to sort alphabetically and everybody else wants to sort alphabetically, that's fantastic. But if nobody wants to sort alphabetically, they want to put what they consider to be the most valuable stuff at the top, then how do we do that? How do we create a system where everybody can create their local variations? Uh, and that can mean turning things on and off. It can mean sorting. It could mean grouping differently. So we're trying to manage the overlap where it exists, the freedom where it exists, and this middle ground. So the model that you might think about uh, is imagine if your term store were more like a salad bar as opposed to you know, uh, a binder that you hand out to everybody. So everything in the term store is essentially there because two or more people want it. So, and you think about that as a salad bar. If there's one item that only one person ever eats, you don't put it on the salad bar. But as long as you know multiple customers might be interested, you wanna make it available. So the way we approach this is to think of the global term store as where there's any potential overlap, where we've seen even the smallest overlap, which means an opportunity for sharing, we put it in the term store and we start small. Only two yeah. people are interested in forestry. That is good enough for me. We're putting forestry in the global site. But if only one group is interested in forestry, it doesn't exist. We're not going to yeah. try to impose. We're not going to force people to share. So um, there's, there's actually a question, Seth. Uh, yes. That, and, and seeing we're talking about the salad bar, this is probably a perfect time for it. Okay. Um, Chrissy G is asking, since currently the term store manager doesn't support poly hierarchies, what are Seth's tips, best practices, magic for sim uh, simulating poly hierarchy in SharePoint? Great question. I'm going to make a note because I think I'm going to touch on that a little bit and then I will come back if I didn't. Phenomenal. So stay tuned, but keep me honest. Um, awesome. So, so well, this is this is one of the things, right? So you'll see there's a bullet there uh, in the bottom half that says organize as you want. It's not the same as poly hierarchy, um, but it might give you a clue on how you could do it. So if everything in the global term store is like stuff on the salad bar, we only put in the salad bar what could possibly be of interest and we don't try to overload it, um, but we, we, we put rules forward. We're like, look, if you're going to take it from the salad bar, you're going to follow our rules. So if we put healthcare in the salad bar, you better know that healthcare means what we want it to mean and you're not allowed to go use it for any other meaning, right? We're being very strict. Think of that as, you know, allergen control, right? And then on top of that, we'll do all the stewardship of that list. So go ahead and enjoy from the salad bar. We'll keep the salad bar running, but you've got to follow our rules. 
And the idea is that we want to basically allow people to take everything that they want, but only what they want. Uh, if you want forestry, it's yours. If you don't, don't. Uh, and so what's happening is think of the salad. So wait, if the term store is the salad bar, well, wait a minute, what are people actually using? And think of it, well, they're building their salads, right? So I'm walking up to the salad bar with my plate, with my local portion of the term store or my local variation that's somehow connected and syndicated to it. And I'm going to put on my plate in the order that I want only the things that I want. So I use copy and reuse as pin as examples, and I say, I want healthcare in my thing. And I'm going to show you what this looks like in a minute in, in, in SharePoint world. I'm going to organize it the way that I want because I have some control over sort order. Um, if I want to do my own stuff with it, I can add my own terms in my local space. Uh, and if I took something by accident and I want to disable it, I can disable it. So if I take the metaphor away and I say, what does this look like, look like inside the term store? Think of it looking like this. So up in the upper left box, focus just on that. That is, think of that as the uh, overall structure of what the global term store looks like. Everybody is sharing. So we have these shared taxonomies. And underneath in the shared space, I can create country two and country four. And actually, I think the way we did this is we didn't actually have country two and country four shared. So I'm tempted to make that quick edit while we're sitting here because I actually think that would be better. Let me see if I can do that on the fly. I'm going to move country two to here, close enough. And country four, it fought me to there. Good enough. So what's really happening is the salad bar is what's in the shared space. And the countries are not in the shared space. That's what I realize is the correction I'm, I'm trying to, to fix here as you're looking at this. So, doo -doo -doo. this isn't seeing that's the taxonomist thing like, oh no, it's an eighth inch out of alignment. So, what's happening is in the term store, you've got a shared space. The shared space is the salad bar. And inside the salad bar, by the way, there's a business activities. Uh, vocabulary and then country two and country four those are two of these local organizations if you will the franchises they're building their own taxonomies they exist in the term store but you can set the permissions such that they have if not exclusive ownership you can certainly shut out all the other countries so country two and maybe your you know master administrators can mess around in country two but they can't touch country four so the idea is that in the shared space where you have uh, there we go, where you have business activities, right? This is the salad bar. And so what you're seeing here in the left hand side is the salad bar. And the salad bar is a big, flat, alphabetical list of all the stuff you can take from the salad bar. And this is totally globally controlled. If you want it, it's our rules, our definitions, our settings. That's it. So if you want automotive, we have automotive defined. We have the synonyms defined. We have the spelling defined. It has an ID. We will not change that ID. That's it, automotive. You want it, you can have it. If you don't, leave it alone. And then each of the individual groups could now start pulling these things in and doing whatever they want with them. So where you're seeing this sort of red font, if you remember, that's the font where I talked about actual people. This is like people outside the governance team are doing whatever they want. So here they liked financial services as a parent. They took it from the salad bar. They took financial services and they put it at their highest level under their business activities list. And they took banking and said, yeah, I don't want banking at the same level. I want it to be under financial services. And we have this thing of high growth markets. That's really important to us and our customers, right? Like forestry and the industry's example. I don't want to lose that. And I'm going to put that under there too. And they add it. And so they're creating a term that nobody else is using. It's their ID, their synonyms, their spelling. They don't want to put a hyphen between the words high and growth. Fine, I'll let them because nobody else cares. It's their stuff. Go ahead and, and, and hurt yourself with the lack of hyphens. We don't care. 
until at some point, perhaps somebody else wants to use high growth markets. And then we have a governance question. How can we have multiple? Right, insurance, private equity, they add wealth management. And they don't, there's a whole lot of stuff they didn't take out of the salad bar because they don't use it or they don't want it. Right, and you can see the differences in how the different groups are doing it. And you'll notice that in addition, they have the ability to resort. So to get to the poly hierarchy question a little bit, um, you could argue that there's poly hierarchy in a way if you think of the individual countries as top levels. So if I like to approach it the Canadian way, I go into the Canada list and I go into their business activities and that's how these things are organized. But if I would like to do it the Netherlands way, well then I go to country four and I go to their business activities. And in a way you have a kind of poly hierarchy um, where you have different ways to get to healthcare or banking or insurance, which are global ideas and global terms. Now, if country two wanted to have banking in a few of its different settings, so maybe they like putting banking under financial services, but maybe they also like putting it somewhere else, they can do that. They can take two salads from the salad bar and put banking on both of them. And as long as it is tied back to the global, it will have the same ID, it will have the same definition, and should somebody do a search for banking, should somebody want to tag something as being related to banking, it's consistent because they took it from the same single source of truth, the same salad bar that is the shared taxonomy at the top. Now, I will say that how you design your navigation and how you design your term store don't have to go one-to-one. -one. There are ways in which you can fudge that. If you wanted to design an interface where banking shows up at the top in one place and at the bottom in another place. If you wanted to combine things in a way for navigational purposes, create tabs that lump things together, you can always do that. You don't have to go straight from the taxonomy into the navigational space. Um, if, however, you are only creating navigation based on the term store, then one way in which you do that is you create multiple lists of terms in different places within your space and point to that particular list with its idiosyncrasies, um, and that becomes your navigation. Keeping in mind that the terms at least have a consistent meaning because you've taken it from the original single source of truth. Um, so there, I'm sort of talking about poly hierarchy then in two different ways, right? There's poly hierarchy within the country, and then there's poly hierarchy because the countries are doing different things. Um, and one of the things that I haven't quite touched on here, but gets things a little interesting, is how you deal with non-preferred terms and how you deal with translations. If the translations are one to one, if country four doesn't want to operate in English, they want to operate in Dutch, then as long as there are Dutch translations for all of these terms at the global level, then it should work just fine and we just translate all of these words into Dutch. Uh, if, however, they would argue that the terms don't have the same meaning. So maybe in another country where here we say government in another place that's like, well, there's three different kinds of governments. What do you mean? That's where we start running into a problem. So you could kind of mess around with your non-preferred terms a little bit, but not really, not for exposing unless you want to override it. And if your translations are literal translations, you can get away with it. But if it starts changing the meaning, it becomes more of a problem. Uh, and to me, those are problems that exist in SharePoint and in the world in general. Um, and I don't have a particularly good answer here unless you're prepared to build some type of custom solution or some layer on top of it where the navigation has a different label that you're managing as a separate process than just taking it straight from the term store. And so that's the key. There's like no renaming allowed. Uh, you're very limited in your ability to do that. Um, and one thing that I just want to point out, there's kind of this little comment down in the bottom, like not shown the 45 terms these countries didn't want to use. This is where the management of this gets sort of interesting. If you are really going to create a flat list, the advantage of the flat list is you're not imposing structure on anyone. And that, by the way, was huge for this particular story, because structure is one of those places where you are going to offend your customers. I, that's not how I think about it. I, that's, that's, you know what I mean? You're not open-minded to the way I want to do it. I don't accept your structure. So as weird as it is 
to flatten that list out from A to Z and have 60, 70, 80 different terms for people to choose from, um, you only have to do the linking once. So when country two decides to put these five things under financial services, their taxonomist, their term store administrator really only has to do it once. It doesn't matter that banking is under B and insurance is under I. Like they just link it once and then they can resort those copied, reused and pinned terms in whatever order they want. And they have the freedom to do that. And so what looks like a real pain in the neck is really just the one point of of creation that you have to worry about it. And at any time, global can try to make changes and that's where we'll deal with the third leg of the stool and the governance. But if, so, you know, so yes. Just um, before you do go to the third leg of the stool, uh, Gary has a really good question here. Is it ever the case or is it advisable in print to have some elements of the salad bar be mandatory? Like if you want to have a salad, it's going to have chickpea. <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's chickpea. That's actually a running joke in, in my family. Um, my kids have decided that it's not a meal unless we impose chickpeas onto it. We have chickpea pasta and chickpea bread. And anyway, um, power of garbanzo. So you could impose on it, but the problem is, is you don't have a good mechanism for that imposition in this case. So you kind of do and you kind of don't. So anyone can do whatever they want in their area of the term store. And in theory, you don't have to impose yourself on that. And that was important in order for people to buy in. Um, on the other hand, you own the term store. So you could always, somebody doesn't put a hyphen in high growth and you could just go in there and say, I'm gonna put a hyphen in there. And you have to be very careful doing that, right? Because you don't want to offend them. So ideally, you could talk to them and say, I have an editorial suggestion. I would really like this to be this way, and here's why. And they could agree or disagree and then work together. And it's nice if you can, you know, get everybody together working in that fashion. Um, but I think in terms of the imposition, just because it's in there doesn't mean they're actually going to use it. They have to build a uh, they have to build some sort of site based on it, right? Just because it's in the term store doesn't mean they ever have to actually build a page that uses what's in the term store. That makes sense. Um, so we want to impose, but I think we felt that we couldn't in this particular situation. I, I do think there are mechanisms for imposition if that's really what you wanted to. I think in this case, it was a little dangerous. Terrific, thank you. So here's kind of how it looked, right? The SharePoint Online had a single term store that everybody had to use. It had one tenant and had to work globally. For security, uh, so for security boundaries, we used groups. So that's where we had, for example, global shared versus country one, or country two. Uh, the shared term sets and the terms reflect the consistent organizing principles. So there's gotta be total agreement at the highest level. Anything that you don't share, do whatever you want in your own space, stay out. Uh, naming conventions are as heavily enforced as they can be. We try to enforce that, but you know it, it doesn't always work. Again, we tried to help organizations feel that they had as much freedom as possible. Um, we enforced description and other labels fields inside the term store. They were fully used. We put in the definitions. If the definition didn't match, too bad because you copied the term, you get the definition. We didn't have you really overriding it. You didn't have permissions. Um, so that's what's going to be there if you roll over it. So there it is, and therefore it's enforced. If you really felt that your word didn't match what the other person wanted, so let's suppose there's two definitions for healthcare, uh, you could put both definitions for healthcare at the highest level or try to manage that in some hierarchical way, but we never really got that far. We were just trying to get basic adoption. Uh, and so in a way, how this process triumphed over getting people uh, is that while humans were distracted by the shiny UX stuff like sort order, uh, we basically focused on making the ideas themselves clear and ambiguous. So we gave people the freedom to fix their sort order and their categories, but we still got people to use the same words, which really comes down to using the same IDs, right? And as I wrote in the little footnote there, I mean, we suspect people think they won too, right? They got to get the benefit of having words all mean the same thing, but they got to use those words however they wanted. Uh, and that really was a, a huge thing. 
Um, I'm skipping over a lot of other implementation parts, so I'm not talking about the groups and the security groups and, and term ownership. There were a lot of decisions there. Um, and in, when you're dealing with test and production environments, there are some significant challenges around managing that. Um, if you're making changes and are you making them locally or globally, there's a lot of process that had to be worked out. But generally speaking, this is how we thought about it. And so the salad bar model worked for us. All right, second leg of the stool, content types. So the challenges you have with content types are it's not just that you have the different names for things as like the taxonomy, but you've got different meanings, different intentions, different tagging requirements. So it's all well and good for me globally to say, I know what an invoice is. Here's an invoice. Everybody has to obey me for invoice. Well, that just doesn't work for people. And the reason it doesn't work is everybody's got a different way of managing their invoices. They want to be tagged differently. They want to have workflow differently. They have different requirements for compliance and how long they save an invoice. And all of that is a real problem because content types are so fundamental to day to day and real time operations that how do you impose a single content type on anybody? But at the same time, there are global advantages to being able to put all the invoices in one place, all the white papers in one place, all the PR in one place. So again, we have these challenges. How do we manage the overlap where people are saying the same things and intending to do the same things and want to share globally doing the same things? How do we put that in place, but give people the opportunity to do their own thing in their own space and create predictable options so that people can kind of mess around in their own space without ruining it? So the way we approached this was around, think of it as there's sort of three layers in terms of your metadata columns. There's the common metadata, which this gets enforced. So going back to Gary's question earlier, can you enforce this? This was a place that you could enforce it. So we needed situations where as a global organization, if there is a best practice, we needed that best practice in place. So we really, really, really want every document to have a title. Can we agree on that? We really, really, really want every document to have an owner. Go ahead and put whatever garbage you want in the owner field, but we're gonna make you have an owner. So that way there's some accountability, some way to work globally, maybe expiration. Everything has to have an expiration date, even if you decide that your expiration date is infinity, but at least it's in there. It's a place to start, right? Then there's the unique metadata. The unique metadata is also global, but, it's not every single document, all content types. So maybe expiration date and title and owner is true for everything. But when we're looking at you know, other situations, maybe we need a comments field, but only for certain types of things. Maybe we need uh, a security constraint on certain things. Maybe we want to have customer names attached for certain things, but not everything. So think of that as the unique. And then there's the specialized metadata where you're down to a single content type and there's something funny that goes on at that level, you want metadata for that as well. And the question became, as you think about all types, some types, one type, where in that spectrum does global let go and let local take over? And so the, the challenge became, you know, how do we sort of organize that? So some of the questions we looked at is we look at what are the out of the box columns? I just want to make a comment. SharePoint has its own types, right? Document, item, and we needed to be clear. We already found differences that when it came down to how people were using the fields uh, for these types, they were already confused. So if you have a field called comments, people used comments for anything because that's what it's for. It's for anything. So we said, you know what? We need to be really careful about how we enforce comments because if the comments are say for reviewer feedback, that's a much better title. Because remember, when you bring everything together globally, comments becomes a giant pile of garbage because this group uses comments this way and that group uses comments that way. I can't use comments. Comments are terrible. So even though it's a global field, it's a global pile of garbage. So can we create better labels and intents for anything that we really want to force people to use? And one of the challenges that I have faced with that I struggle with around SharePoint is you can have a title field and a name field and everybody thinks those mean a little slightly different things in practice. What's the difference between the title and the name? I've seen many situations 
where they think the name is somehow the file name. So it should have a dot PPTX at the end of it because that's what the name is. But the title can be anything I want, my presentation. Other people think, no, the title and the name, they mean the same thing and they copy paste the values from one into the other. Other people say, well, as long as it has a name, title is optional. No, wait, it's title is mandatory and name is optional. Is it name automatic? And so even at that level, we start running into challenges. So we wanted to make sure that when we created those fields, that we didn't just take it out of the box and say title, everybody gets that. We wanted to be even more particular. Uh, and so when there's any difference, we would create a new column and try to make the other one go away or be optional. Um, and when we were dealing with links, we were using IDs because when you're dealing with lots of organizations that have their own structures and move things around all the time, IDs tended to be more stable. So uh, there's, yes. another, there's another um, question. So uh, it's Chrissy G. Thanks, Seth, for addressing the poly hierarchy challenge. That was good with the case example. Did you factor any review of the taxonomy, i.e. the salad bar, annually or some sort of schedule within the governance? So great question. Third leg of the stool. I'll bring this up again, but I want to answer this now because I think it's a really great question. Nothing that I'm talking about so far is ever going to exist forever, right? And if it did, that would be bad. So we're not putting anything in stone. So especially when things are getting started, um, you need to be as flexible as possible, which means you need to be open to changing rather frequently. Uh, there were some specific constraints with this project about the speed of governance. Some of it had to do with different organizations working at different speeds. So, you know, organization one might be doing a lot of things every day, every week, every month, but organization two does things at a quarterly level. So knowing that they work at different speeds means you kind of want to have available but impose different expectations around speed, right? An organization that doesn't change very much having to constantly get change requests because some other organization is insisting on changing all the time, that's kind of painful. So we thought about ideas around batching. So we might change something right away, but make it optional, or we might have local folks make their changes ahead of us so that globally we would then catch up and it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so there were some interesting challenges there. Uh, if you take it away from this organization and just say, how often should you change? Ideally, you've got a governance team where all the right people are talking to each other and they decide as a team. That's your circle of chairs where people are talking to each other. Uh, that's the happy path. So I'm the global taxonomist and I am managing industries. I've, I'm in charge of the industry salad bar. And meanwhile, the US industry person and the Canada industry person and the Netherlands industry person, uh, we have meetings on a regular basis and we listen to our constituents and we communicate through teams or whatever method we have to post our concerns and changes and wants and needs and we decide when we want to do it so if the folks in the netherlands are saying we're doing this big thing it's happening in april i need to have it ready for april meanwhile the us and the canada are like i don't see how that affects me and this is terrible timing we have a coronavirus thing going on here we're not going to get to this until the summer Hopefully, everybody can get together and make decisions on how to go forward. But I think you're right. Regular reviews are extremely important, but also having frequent and listened to feedback from all of the stakeholders is extremely important. So there's no great answer. Uh, as a best practice, I would say that when you create the salad bar, you have to decide at that moment of creation how often you want to change it over. Today, coronavirus, we're cleaning the salad bar every hour and a half, right? In fact, we're, there is no salad bar. Salad bar's gone. We'll come back to the salad bar some other day. But you know what I mean? Like, how often do you, do you send somebody to remove the wilted food and clean up the space, right? The same is true with the taxonomy. Healthcare is constantly moving target. Finance, constantly moving target. These industries are moving. So those are terms that you need to be on top of as, as they change. Transportation, eh, not so much is happening over there. Right? High tech computers changes a lot. So how often do you want to meet? How often do you want to manage it? And the speed with which you manage the industry's taxonomy is going to be completely different to the country's taxonomy. Countries are generally not changing fast enough and noticeably enough that I need to jump in there all the time. 
probably it's completely stable until somebody says it's unstable and then we have to go in and make a fix. So you're going to find that uh, pace for yourself. And I think you need to get your stakeholders together to decide what that is. Um, just to be clear, then there are three sources for staying on top of it. One, set your own pace and follow it. Two, whenever somebody wants a change, decide whether you need to handle it right away or batch it for later. And you'll see that in some of the flow charts I showed toward the end. Uh, and three, uh, anybody who notices a problem, that problem should be escalated. So as soon as search is a giant mess, you better be on top of it. Hopefully you've noticed before it became a giant mess. Um, but that's the nature of governance and stewardship. So this is where the result came. So imagine on the left hand side, so I'm, I've chosen to name the, this particular company Acme. Uh, on the left hand side, you've got the SharePoint content types. This is the stuff out of the box, right? Item and document. And the first thing you do before you bring it into global is you make it Acme specific. So I'm not going to take the SharePoint item. I'm going to create my own item, Acme item. And maybe at this point, I assign a country, I assign a compliance requirement, a legal requirement, I put retention plans at a default, whatever it is that I need to do to run my business the way I think it needs to be run, I immediately impose it. It's still as generic and seemingly useless as item, but it's got that extra little secret sauce that makes it work for my company. Uh, we are strongly in favor of never using something out of the box without company fying it first. Even if all you do is change the name to put your company name in front of it, do something because it's yours. Um, and then in addition, you start creating your subtypes at that highest level. So you're creating event, page, image, video. So these are variations where you might start applying other as generically as possible metadata. So what's the difference between a document and an image? Well, an image has a resolution. Done. That's it. So a document with a resolution is the only thing that makes it an image. Great. Oh, wait, a video also has resolution. Yes, but a video also has duration. So it's a document with a resolution and a duration. That's video and nothing else. Now, maybe you want to put in copyright information and maybe the rights information is different for your multimedia than your documents. Maybe how you want to handle owner is different, but the goal was to stay as absolutely generic as possible. What is the global minimum that you could get away with? And this is genuinely global minimum because remember, this is like your salad bar. If they're not going to take from the salad bar, they're going to go off and do their own thing. That's not how I think of images. For me, images are a totally different thing. And if they can't build their version off of yours, then they're going to build their own away from yours and it's broken and you're not working with them. Then you have the specializations that take place. So in addition to having just say a generic event, we also have a slightly less generic political event. And maybe the reason you want to create political event is because for your organization, you need to track politics for compliance reasons in a fundamentally different way. For a lot of financial companies, for example, there are laws that are if you have an event and you're promoting a candidate or you're doing lobbying or you're spending money, there's all sorts of additional compliance things you need to be paying attention to. So we are going to impose that globally. It's a political event. We need to stay on top of it. We're going to add yet more metadata. So right now in these first three columns, that is the salad bar for content type, right? We're not going to let anybody use the generic types, but they can use our base types and our specialized types and anything they want, they can now build off of that. So if we really want to force this with the salad bar analogy, which I think we shouldn't, but let's do it. This is the plate. You can take any size plate you want to put your salad on. You want a square plate, you want a small plate, you want a giant plate, you want a bowl, that's great. And again, if you're going to use a bowl, you have to use one of our bowls. Now you can decorate it however you want, you can paint it when you get home, but it's still a bowl and you have to use our bowl. And then from there, the local groups will derive their own content types from anything off in the middle two columns. So if you have an event, it's no longer an Acme event. It's now Canada event. And Canada has a lot of social events, so they go and create another one based on that. They're building their own hierarchy. Now, you'll notice that what's weird here is you have to kind of ask yourself, where does this stuff live? And the answer is, yeah, it all lives in exactly the same place. So if Canada wants to create an event they're going to have to build the event 
in the same space. They don't, unlike the term store where I can go and create my own little corner, you can't really do that with content types. So Canada's events are all listed under all of the Acme events. So under Acme event in, in the content type hub, you'll have the global Acme event, you'll have the global Acme political event, which will be one level below. And next to Acme political event will be Canada event. And below that will be Canada social event. So it's gonna look really awful, but it's centrally controlled and the naming convention makes it absolutely clear who owns it and what you're allowed to do. And There's management of the content types ends up being centralized in that way. Sorry, David, you're interrupting with something. Yeah, I, I do apologize. Uh, Mike has a really good question that actually falls in line with what you just said. What guidelines do you recommend around content type inheritance depth? So I personally do not care how deep you go. I just, just go. go, go as deep as you want. The downside is maintenance. If something changes, you've got a lot of changes to deal with. There are also opportunities for breakage. So, and this is something that actually would happen. So in this space, for example, Canada creates a social event. Maybe there's some metadata field for event. Um, call it, let's call it, uh, uh, I'll make something up. Let's say it's a, a, a geographic location and it's tied to the geography taxonomy. But they've started adding social events that don't have location, they're virtual. So what's happened is at the event level, the global folks in all of their wisdom decided that physical location should be a mandatory field. Well, Canada disagrees. Canada does not want a physical location for its social events because it does online social events or it does long term social things that don't even have a location that just sort of persist forever. Maybe they don't even have dates. Maybe it's just an open walk in, walk out event. So what's happening is Canada cannot work with the global. So they're going to break inheritance and they're allowed. They can say, I don't want that field at the event level to be mandatory. I want it optional. I don't want it to point to that taxonomy. I want it to point to my taxonomy. And that is OK. And each one of these places where you allow for greater specification, greater power is more maintenance and more opportunity for breakage. Because keep in mind, if global folks then say, oh, we're going to make a change to event it, you're going to feel it in Canada because Canada has done their own customization on top of it and they're going to have to deal with it. But I don't have a problem with with depth. The question I would ask, um, here's the best practice that I look at. I think optional fields are dangerous in practice. I think if you have a field and you can make it mandatory, then you should. And the, some of the ways in which you can do that, by the way, is you could put a term in your taxonomy that is generic, but is therefore allows you to fill the field and make it mandatory. So for example, if they can't use the physical location for events because it's remote, then I would say the problem isn't that the field is mandatory. The problem is that remote is not a country. So go back and fix your taxonomy. Add remote or nowhere or everywhere, like put in some other terms so that they don't have to override the field and make it optional because it doesn't work for them. Keep it mandatory, but give them terms that they can use that will allow them to do it. And so I don't have a problem with the depth in general. That's kind of my my quick answer. Um, what you're really trying to do is manage the tagging. And that to me would be how I think about it. Um, because the tagging is just, even in a search environment, if I'm searching among social events, I could just as easily do that as event of type social. I don't need a content type for it. The only reason I want a new content type is because I have more metadata that I want to add, but I don't want to add it to all events. So I'm avoiding the optionality. Does that make sense? It does to me, and I'm <laughs> sure, sure they'll. Uh, okay. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll actually um, be more questions um, in line, especially if uh, um, if they so desire, so to speak. Fair enough. So let me let me let me finish this section. So the content type hierarchy has these sort of incremental expectations. So global content types are managed globally. They're designed for derivation and inheritance which then get managed at the lower levels. So that you have a document, you have a Canada document, you have a Canada tax document. And what this does is it allows you to attach 
global fields to global metadata, including whatever compliance and specialization you think you need that you consider a best practice or you're trying to actually impose on the local groups. Ideally, the local groups take the plate from the salad bar and as necessary, increase, not decrease requirements. If they decrease the requirements, they're overriding. If they're adding, they're not. So that's one of the reasons you want the most plain vanilla content types you can get away with. Uh, and there were situations where the local groups wanted to relax the requirements. Oh, we made this globally mandatory. Oh, but that doesn't work for us. Well, remember, we're trying not to offend them. We're trying not to put them in a situation where we force them to do something that they don't want to do so much that they go off and go rogue and build their own thing in their own place. Because as soon as they do that, there is no sharing. There is no proper reporting. There is no global search, right? So we're looking for the tiniest crack in their defenses saying, come on, you know, just do this, just this one thing. Like all of your documents, please just derive it from our generic vanilla document. That's all we ask. And we would hope that over time it would grow. And that is sort of the trick. So we established very easy to use, very generic content types, which by the way, I can tell you as a consultant, when you walk in and you talk to all of these people in all of these countries and you're working with them, and then you come up with your answers and your answers are, yeah, you're going to create a document. And they're like, really? And just that's it? Document? You don't have any other suggestions? That's like, we have a lot of suggestions, but we're just going to give you document. And, and why, why are we paying you all this money <laughs> to tell us you need document? And it's like, because it's the only thing that your customers will accept. But we are going to build in the ability for people to customize on top of it and grow over time as new ideas go to prominence, as the world changes, as opportunities present themselves, we can make changes at the global level. So, oh, this law just passed. Now we have to track our documents in a certain way. You can do that at the global level and it, you're now in a way forcing everybody to accept it. They can override it, but they have to go out of their way to override it. And in many cases, they won't if what you're doing makes sense. So we're imposing the smallest bit possible. Again, we're worried about generic labels like description and comments, they're discouraged. We made sure that in our content types, we were picking better labels like purpose or user notes so that people could use these things consistently. We're essentially pushing those best practices onto people. If they wanna go and create a description field because, hey, where'd it go? Go for it, add it. But no one else can use it because it's your local piece. What is global can show up in global search and becomes visible. And if your documents look like crap in global search, somebody's going to notice and say, hey, our content looks like crap in global search. Let's fix that. And so there's almost that sort of public shaming type of thing that's going on where, wow, that country really seems to have it together. Why can't we do that? So we believed that just by getting people onto the same platform, by forcing them to talk to each other, that this would slowly grow. And that's really the key. By starting small and generic, we were able to get quick adoption or at least more adoption than we had. Organizations that were more sophisticated could make more and more customizations. But remember, there were these groups that had no resources. So everything we gave them, they were happy to get. And they were actually some of the first adopters. So we're out to the last leg of the stool, and that is behavior. So content types, metadata, term storm, that's great on paper. Uh, now what? So remember, this is our this is our world, right? So we're doing our best to say, please, ma'am, please, sir, we've done the smallest amount that we can do. We're doing our best. If you really need something, let us know. It goes into the queue. And the question really is that can you sustain this? Um, does this really work? Because at some point you could have a mob of users, right? You have some folks who would just have to go off and go do their own thing. So when we think about how we shape governance, what you're really balancing in governance, and everybody has read this and seen this in a million places, right? You're essentially balancing centralized control and federated management. You're basically saying, hey, we're global and we know what we're doing and we're in charge and you have to follow our rules at all times, centralized control. And then you've got the federated management. Hey, we're specialists. We're actually working with the customers. We're the ones actually trying to get things done. All those rules are obnoxious. We know what we need. We're going to do this ourselves and don't step on our toes and get in our way because let's be honest, we're the ones making the money, not you. 
And this is a good and natural conflict. And it is one of the challenges with any organization succeeding and growing. And the balance is precarious and it is seriously uncomfortable, especially when you're doing this for the first time. It threatens the status quo, interferes with longstanding beliefs and behaviors. Uh, it, it introduces people with competing priority. So you bring somebody in and they have a whole new idea and a whole history and a whole thing and it's really hard to make it work. So when we think about how we design governance, what you ask yourself, what drives change? Uh, there's really a few things. There's the post-disaster lesson learned. Oh crap, this was a mess. We can never let this happen again. And everybody jumps onto the centralized control. Or you have a near miss crisis that's somehow been averted. You can have outside forces. Oh, there's a new financial law. Oh, the coronavirus is gonna change how we do things. How will we wanna deal with that? You have the inspired leader who read something in a magazine and says, you know what we're gonna do? And then boom, suddenly you have the centralized control. Uh, and then what I think of as sort of the last idea is because SharePoint made me. Uh, that was actually the story we had. Uh, there was a need to go to SharePoint online and stop everybody from having their own tenant. And oh crap, now we all have to, to work together. We all found ourselves on the island and we're trying not to vote each other off. So the way we approached it was really to look at the smallest piece of governance we could start with, the seed um, that we could plant, right? So centralized control was unwanted. Nobody wanted it. It was to some extent necessary and people could understand why somebody else might want it, but it was really hard to accept. Um, and so it was a real disruption. And so the reason is when you looked at the part of that said everybody can buy into at least this, it is flat and boring and basic. And so our global IA was essentially the smallest possible piece of the total design but it was the part everybody was doing anyway, so what harm is it? Everybody had documents. How hard is that? Documents. Believe it or not, people would push back. People would say, I don't want an expiration date. I don't want an owner. Some of our documents don't have owners. Re really? They don't have owners? Well, we have creators. Well, aren't they the owner? No, they create it and then push it out into the world and now it's sort of ours. Well, then you're the owner. <laughs> So it was this interesting challenge where it's like, well, no, it's like the team owns it or the company owns it. And it's not really that we own it. It's just that we created it or it's on our system. So, OK, so now is owner something we ignore or do we fight over it? And this was the sort of process we went through. But the last trick that we had up our sleeve was that we knew that if we could start small enough, it would grow. We knew that if we could get things going, plant the seed, uh, find the crack in the armor that we had the potential to grow. And so what I have here is might be too small to read, uh, but these are a little bit generic. These are flow charts that kind of represented, well, how do we manage the, a change? So looking at just the taxonomy, what we did is we acknowledged that there are people who don't want change. And we said, okay, if you fight hard enough, we will let you in because we are not going to impose. We are going to wait for those opportunities and otherwise we will just suggest things at random. So if you were to follow the global, if you were to follow the change on the left here, which is the local organization wants to change, but basically they want to change. Does the change affect anybody else? If it doesn't, it's all yours, go for it, great idea. If it does affect other people, we would have to go to those other people and say, well, how do you feel about this? And if the other people go, nah, we don't like it, then we would go to the local organization and say, okay, sorry, do it on your own. It was that simple. If you couldn't get somebody to cross to your side of the island, they were not on your team, fine, do whatever you want on your side of the island. And it was this process where the local organizations would essentially have to work with us, helping them coordinate with all the other local organizations to make their way there. Um, in a situation where change could be made, but not right now, because the pace was hard, or you can make this change, but it's gonna be a huge burden, we would address that. Can the global organization help relieve the burden? Can we time it a little differently? How do we implement it? Global was essentially the same way, but you'll notice the boxes kind of go in a slightly different order. Global wants to make a change. Well, how do the local organizations feel about it? If they all go screaming, running from the room, no, 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 terrible change, you can't do that right now. Global will be like, okay, and just quit. Or, they might find a way to implement the change in one or two places, but let everybody else fix it with overriding and lack of inheritance and customization. So we could force everyone to do something or force them to not do that thing, but they would have to do it actively. And it was that same 
process. Is it going to affect things? Who is it going to affect? Is it going to be a really expensive thing? And we also looked at the different pace. So some things we could change right away because they're small and other things we promised only to change at the beginning of the year when we're already, you know, we're doing over the December holidays, we kind of do it at once. And so we really tried to focus on this. And these flow charts represent the term store changes. We had similar flow charts um, for other things that were taking place. So in summary, uh, the question is, how did government governance triumph over the people? And by the way, I, I admittedly, this is tongue in cheek because governance is the people. Um, so really what it is, is how did global find a way to actually work in this hostile environment? Uh, and it came down to starting small, staying optimistic, uh, and in the spirit of cooperation, snag the middle piece. <laughs> uh, basically, we found that if you could grab something at the very foundation of what they were doing, uh, you would have the ability um, to hang in there as opposed to trying to make changes from the outside, which by the way is how I've seen a lot of governance work. They take some small thing on the outside that they don't think is going to be offensive um, and they're going to work on that one piece and they think that slowly over time they're going to work their way in. We ended up doing it the other way. We looked for what was actually the common ground, even if the common ground was the size of a postage stamp. And we started with that and we built outward from that. Uh, and I will make a point that, you know, if there weren't actual people doing actual work, there'd be no middle piece. So as fun as it might be to talk about people as problematic, because sometimes that's how it feels, the truth is, is the work that they were doing is what established a middle piece. It was what they had in common, what they did that was similar, the mental models that they all shared. What is a document? What is an image? What is a video? How do you behave ethically? How do you make sure that your working environment uh, does not get overloaded with old versions and other garbage? And and as time moves, um, getting global involved at that level should continue to bring value and over time find a better balance between the centralized governance and what was uh, at first an entirely federated space. And with that, I will say thank you. That was awesome. awesome. Uh, so oh, I don't well. have any other questions. I'm going to give everyone a, like a, like 30 seconds more. Um, if you have questions for Seth, um, uh, pretty much it's a uh, free reign uh, at this point. Uh, please feel free to type them in the chat. I know there's there's a delay. So uh, that's the reason why I'm kind of rambling right now. Um, <laughs> for those of you, <laughs> oh, <that's why. laughs> yeah, that's why. No, if if everyone knows uh, knows me, uh, then you know I'm like Jetfire from Transformers. I'm episodic. I don't really have a point. I just continue to ramble. Um, my wife tells me that constantly, actually. But with the same regard, uh, that's part of what the broadcast is. So therefore, I'm giving time for you all to catch up to the end. It's a 20 to 40 second delay, uh, just to make sure that you have an awesome experience. So Seth, I've got a question for you. Do you have any, uh, any ideas around um, best practices for the number of metadata that should be available on any particular document? Do you have any statistics on where you see like drop off of people saying screw it, I'm not going to bother if it has more than X number of pieces of metadata on it? I, I have a lot of thoughts in this space. Let me try to pick the key <laughs> idea. Um, okay. Great question. I do not believe that there is a global maximum or a global minimum. I. There's been talk with information architecture, like how many clicks and how many spaces and how much time and all of that is well and good. But I think we all know that it's highly contextual. So is there a global answer? I think the answer is no, other than it depends as an answer. I think what I would really focus on is. here. So here's my core belief when it comes to this kind of thing. If people value it, they do it. And if I have to tag this thing with eight fields that require me to really think about it, you have to ask myself, do I value it enough to bother? And it's a complicated question, but there are environments in which 
you will fill in all of the tags. And I'm going to give you a great example. If I told you that here's this thing, here's this document, and it's got eight tags that are actually very complicated. They're like topics tags. Who's my audience and what's the topic, right? Like things where it's not as easy as in like, you know, what day is today and who are you, right? It's like, I really have to analyze and synthesize and then pick from a taxonomy and ah, why would I ever want to do that? And I'll tell you why, because that thing is something you're selling. And you know that if you tag the crap out of it, it will show up in more search engines in front of more people. And guess what? Those people are more than happy to tag it. And examples of that are, you know, people who sell music or who sell art through databases, right? And it is tagged up the wazoo. And I don't think people are complaining. They just do it. It's just their job. Uh, people who deal with compliance and have to fill in all the tags to do rights management or security controls. I'm not saying that they like tagging as their job, nor do they define themselves as taggers for a living, but they do it and they generally do it without complaining because they see the value and they believe in it. So in all other circumstances, it's going to seem like, why am I doing this? This isn't for me. I'm tagging it so someone else can find it. I don't care. I know where it is. <laughs> so either you educate them, which only goes so far, or the way I look at it is you find somebody else or something else to do it. So my best practice is what you want to do is you want to relieve the burden of the tagging as much as possible. It's not about how many fields. It's how much energy it takes to do any one field at any one time. If your taxonomy has 3000 terms in it, that's just awful. Like nobody wants to do that unless they're all unique and you can auto complete like phone numbers. Like if it were a list of phone numbers, I type in my number, it's easy, right? So again, oh, there's no burden. It's so it's not how many there are. It's how hard was it? Um, I think that there are so many opportunities for automating, semi automating, guessing, contextually constricting. There are so many ways in which you can prevent the giant open field that could be filled with anything. Um, that it's really helpful and take advantage of what you know about the person, what you know about the context in which that item was created uh, and just don't show everything. So an example of that and what I was talking about, we had that giant salad bar of industries that would be horrible to tag with. But why would you point to that? Point to the country specific list that everybody understands and works with. And even better, if they're working in a library that's specific to a particular industry, why are you making them tag it? just automatically put the industry in. It's obvious, it's, it's what they're working with. So you're really trying to relieve that burden, not by reducing the amount of metadata, but by reducing the difficulty for creating the metadata, because ultimately the metadata is one of the easiest tools for improving findability, collaboration, compliance, and ultimately productivity. Removing a field because people don't want to do it, to me is the last resort. Find a way to speed it up instead. That's my recommendation. So bringing people into it, there's, there's a statement versus a question um, by Deb. Hit me. But, uh, and the, the quote is, but what, uh, sorry, but we have folders for that and search still finds the stuff. <laughs> so. Uh, You've heard that before, haven't you, Seth? I, I, what's a folder? <laughs> <laughs> Let me look that up. Uh, I don't know. Is that a generation thing? Do our kids know what folders are? Um, so, as a mechanism, I don't necessarily have a problem with folders in themselves. Um, the challenge you run into is: Are people compliant with the folders? So, are the folders well named? Are they exposed only when they're useful? Uh, do they automatically? I mean, I. Whether it's a folder or a library or some other type of container like a document set, right? All of those things are useful ways of potentially applying metadata to the other things, right? That's what we're after. And I just said a minute ago, anything that can speed up the metadata process is worth it. In SharePoint, the problem with a folder is that when you put the metadata at the folder level, it doesn't really put it on the item level. So unless you can find a way to inherit the folder metadata, which you do with things like document sets and libraries. Document sets, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you inherit. So, and I've seen this too. There are other tools. There's there's a CMS where um, you actually, uh, 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 it, it's not a SharePoint thing. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to use this as an example, but it works with libraries as well. You can create, think, I shall I just say it? You can create a library that is so over tagged that anything you put in it is automatically tagged with all that stuff. 
So let's imagine that. Let's imagine that I have a specialized folder. It's got my name in it, my country in it, my favorite task, the stuff that I'm using it for, the time of day, generic compliance information that's appropriate for me, and it represents where I am on the site. Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So it's like that library has essentially a default set of metadata when I drag something into it. And that default set of metadata could have 35 different metadata fields where 34 of them have default values and the other is a checkbox. Like if you could really pound away at your system so that you could have such a specialized inbox. Now imagine I get an email and I drag the attachment and I go, ooh, and I drop it into the folder and kaboom, 34 pre-coordinated metadata fields in a checkbox I might not care about. That's it, how awesome was that? And I have seen system designs where instead of saying, oh, we're gonna make everybody tag everything, what instead what they do is they over-engineer the inboxes and they create tons and tons and tons of libraries and document sets and that kind of thing. And then instead of having you tag, you just have to find the absolute precise point in which to enter your document and you've just saved all the tagging. Now that sounds sort of absurd, but if you think about it, in certain situations, it's actually pretty cool, right? It's the mail slot. It's the letters come in and you throw them into the slot and you have one slot for every address. And that's great. And when you put it into that address, you immediately know who it's going to and the house and the postage and everything. It's like, it's what a system. And if you can get really good at sorting, you can be really crappy at tagging because they're exactly the same thing. You So I don't have a problem with folders except that folders don't maintain the metadata, but folder equivalents, I'm okay with. Um, and then search leverages all of that metadata. So for me, just like you create lots and lots of inboxes, a really good search allows you to generate or dynamically do lots and lots of out boxes through filters, through buttons, through you know s specific searches. There's all sorts of different ways in which you can be looking to a search or a library view that's dynamic, uh, any type of dynamic that's leveraging the values of your, on your content types, the metadata that's there across content types, and, and, and so forth. To me, metadata is ultimately what makes it stick. I think the whole idea that search will find it anyway is really a question of how is it finding it. If the metadata is there and search is what everybody uses, then yeah, I don't care where you store it, store it, whatever. If search is really effective because everything is tagged, then I don't necessarily care about how it's organized, all right? Because that's how search works. But usually in an organization, you've got to find that balance as well. Mm. Hey, Mike, do we have time for one more question? You bet. Nobody's awesome. picking us out. <laughs> That's, that is <laughs> the very pizza's true. Old, man. That is there are no janitors old. wandering around making us feel guilty. No nothing. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> no construction uh, in the next room. Yeah. So the, so the question for you, Seth, is folksomony, taxonomy, uh, or hybrid, what is the best solution for organizations? Or I know it depends uh, on the organization as well, but it's something to be said about a folks army being able to be utilized to capture information to feed the taxonomy uh, by the hybrid approach. But how do you see, see it? Where's the value and where, where can it go awry? Well, they can both go awry. Um, it it's another one of those tensions between centralized control and, you know, uh, a federated. In this case, it's really like a populist approach, right? So if everybody can pick whatever tags that they want and they can jump on whichever bandwagons they want, then folksonomy does the trick, and you don't need any centralized control. People can figure it out. I, it, it if I say it comes down to use cases. What I'm really trying to say is that it comes down to does the current system meet whatever your business needs might be. I think folksonomy works really well when you're doing something emergent. You can seed it as well. You could, before you ever launch it, drop the equivalent of a taxonomy into your folksonomy. So the terms are already there, all ready to autocomplete for the first person in. So essentially it's kind of like, you know, you're putting the you're putting the twister circles on the floor. And then you're hoping that people can follow the rules. And then of course, Twister does what it does and everything gets twisted. Um, but at least you started with circles and you know that it's going to be a game of Twister as opposed to just a wrestling match. Um, so I feel like if you can seed the folksonomy because you have a strong belief, but then you don't impose it, 
um, there is a natural momentum that's going to happen because people will prefer what's auto completed, right? They like that sense that someone has done this before me. Someone has thought about it or again, wow, I only had to type two letters. The thing did it for me. Yay. And they just liked the speed with which they were able to do it. So in an emergent situation, I think folksonomy works really well. I think folksonomy also works really well in something that is intended to remain immature. So it's obviously immature when you first start it, but maybe you want it to stay immature. It's a social space. It's anything can happen there. It's whatever you want, right? What what did you do over the weekend? What's a recipe that you really like? It's like everybody hashtagging their Twitter, right? It's like, it doesn't matter. That is a space that's intended to be, you know, social and changing. So I think that's another place where folksonomy really works. The one place where, otherwise I'd say taxonomy, because it's gonna meet your business needs because it's gonna get things done. The one place where you're kind of stuck in between where people want to make changes but can't because gosh darn taxonomies in my way the way you solve that problem is through having available receptive taxonomists stewards administrators someone who will listen and say oh that's a good thing i'm going to add it into the taxonomy they shove it into the taxonomy almost right away it's immediately available they let you know and it works and that would be the best thing managing that can be tricky you don't, if you take what everybody says and then two days later, oh, you know what, I changed my mind, can you rename it? Is a pain in the neck. But again, if it's only for them, what's the harm? As soon as other people start using these terms, they must slow down. That I can't change a term that eight other people or eight other teams or eight other countries are using because I am gonna mess up all of their, you know, <laughs> I was gonna say folders, their library structures. Um, because their, their views are dependent on the metadata that you're about to mess up for them. Mm -hmm. So, that would be the place where, again, you think of it, it goes back to the presentation of the, the center of the Venn diagram. Um, if few people are using it, you want it to be as wide open as it can be. And as more and more people start using it, you're going to wish you had greater control. And in a single vocabulary, there could even be pockets where you want to control some of it and not others. Maybe the parent categories, maybe the industry standard categories, maybe the categories that have been there longest. Um, and trying to balance that, I think, usually comes down to having a taxonomist that can find a way to maintain the relationships with the consumers, the people who are using the terms or the people who are using the, the IA, whatever form it's in. Uh, and I think it's the same logic for page design, right? If I'm in charge of designing your pages, I can make changes as frequently as I want. I just have to know who I'm disrupting. Uh, so I think that's, that's how it is. I love the idea of folksonomy. If it's done well, it will evolve into a taxonomy because it did such a good job. As long as the folksonomy continues to fail, it will live as a folksonomy. Um, it's as it starts to mature, I think it, it, it hardens in a way and becomes taxonomy. And that's where I become uh, more in favor of that. Terrific. Uh, no more questions. Mike, do you have any other questions? Dimitri? I've got nothing. He answered all my questions. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I think this was great. Thank you. It, it was definitely phenomenal. Um, it's something that I think everyone in the SharePoint and Office 365 space struggles, especially the ones who are admins of it. Um, it's it's a battle that's constant. One thing that comes to mind, where do you see the best fit as far as acceptance? Does it come from top down or is it more a grassroots and going from bottom up? I've seen it work both ways, but always with tension. I think the least tense approach is one where that's somehow more collaborative. Uh, I've been in a couple of situations where the collaboration mechanics are created first, meaning before I mess around with this taxonomy, I'd like to know who's interested in this taxonomy. I did this one exercise in a, in a, in a room once that I really liked as we were building essentially their content models. So they were building a customer 360, which was kind of fun because we were in a room that was like literally circular. So we it was literally the customer 360. So we would have a big sheet of paper about contact information and a big sheet of paper about their interests and a big sheet of paper about the products that they subscribe to. And the idea was if you could know everything about a customer, it would be on one of these sheets of paper and they were organized in a way that made sense. Contact information, product subscriptions, interests, mailing lists, security concerns. 
Um, and before we left the room, now I'm mean, keep in mind, none of this was built, right? This was all being dreamed up. Before we left the room, we had enough representatives from across the organization. We gave them all a Sharpie and we said, look, before you leave the room, if you are interested in anything on any of these pieces of paper, you need to write your name on it right now. And if you don't write your name on the piece of, and if you write your name on the piece of paper, we will call you, you will be recruited, you will be a stakeholder. When this gets built and as it gets changed, you will be contacted. And you might find that to be really, really annoying because you are volunteering to be a part of our team. So if you don't wanna be part of the team, don't put your name down and save yourself a lot of trouble. But let's be clear, if you don't put your name on that piece of paper, you will never hear about it until after it's done. And then you will have to deal with the change. So if you don't deal with product subscriptions, don't put your name on that. Don't go to any of the meetings and don't worry about changes because it has nothing to do with your life. And this was a way of really trying to identify who is genuinely a stakeholder for each one of these aspects. What was great about this exercise and exercise like it is that we had the team built before we had the architecture itself built, before the IA. So we didn't go out and figure out how to manage subscriptions first. We figured out who is interested in how subscriptions are managed. And we started with that. And then you would have a governance meeting. Okay, on the first of next month, we're gonna have a governance meeting of the product management taxonomy team. And maybe only three people wrote their name on because it's a small thing and nobody cares. That's fine. Meeting started with those three people. How do you wanna begin? I already have a list. That's great, let's just do that. That was it, done. But what happened is you balanced Going back to the question, you balance the global need with the local need, the grassroots, all at the same time. By bringing everybody in a room, we said globally we're going to do this. And then by bringing just those three people in the room, we said grassroots, we're going to build it. And in the end, you had that balance. And now everything had to go through those that small team. And as the taxonomy became more adopted or more complicated, as people came and went, they had to be part of the team, right? It's the user group. And so we found that this user group approach um, made it more democratic. So in the end, the architecture enforced it, but the people were, you know, at the populist level. Um, and that model tends to have the least amount of tension, feels the most collaborative and the most social uh, in terms of building something new. If you're fixing something that already exists, that's different. And I think it's just, what are you fixing? Um, but I love the idea of starting new by finding the people first. So here my whole presentation is like IA versus people. And it turns out here I am ending it by saying, you know what, start with the people. And so that would be my recommendation. Awesome, terrific. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, I really appreciate um, you taking your time to, to uh, presenting. It was absolutely awesome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, do you want to uh, throw the slides back up for um, the, the finalization of uh, today's broadcast? Sure. Awesome. One second. One. Uh, yeah, uh, as, uh. as Mike pulls up these slides, um, I think we, we could still have a virtual raffle in using the Q&A to accept answers. Sure. That's a good idea. All right, Mr. Seth, do you have any ideas for questions for that? You can start thinking about that while we go over uh, community stuff. What am I? What am I thinking about? A raffle? <laughs> yes. What am, I, what am I missing? So, so basically, just um, questions from from your um, presentation. When oh, you I see. come up with uh, when you when you uh, just come up with something, you know, three like what two three questions, guys. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll have them put in the QA and whoever answers the correctly first will uh, uh, will win that particular prize, uh, uh, raffle right. prize. Will do. So Mike, um, how, how are you holding up on the uh, slides? Uh, Finding the right screen now. Oh, wow. That's a lot of stuff I have open. <laughs> yeah, the side effect of working. 
right? Mike, I have it handy if you want me to share. I got it. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. All right. So, uh, the upcoming community events. Dimitri, you want to take this one? Mm, yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's do it. <clears throat> so this date is teams, wrong. <laughs> so Teams Thursday was originally planned for April 2nd. Uh, but given the coronavirus, everything has been postponed. So the team's organizers have pushed it out um, until sometime, I believe, in July. June we'll, 3rd. June 3rd. Excellent. But in the meantime, they will be hosting a series of webinars around Microsoft Teams. So if you are not part of their mailing list, we would highly suggest going to teamsthursdayne.org. Um, register for the event, and from there you'll be able to um, you know, essentially get those email updates as they provide them. They have also asked that if you have registered already, but you are not able to attend, that you go into Eventbrite and cancel your registration. That way they could plan accordingly for how many people can attend given the new date. Yeah, that event is sold out. So freeing up those tickets is greatly appreciated, guys, if you can't make it. Right. If you can make it, you don't don't feel obligated if you're you're still going. <laughs> yep. See, okay. I did it on this slide. <clears throat> so there's a you know we're seeing more and more of these conferences move to online formats, um, which you know quite frankly makes it easier for a wider set of people to attend. So tomorrow there's the Power Platform Online Conference. Um, so check that out. Power Platform now covers Power BI. Power Automate, which covers Flow, um, as well as a number of other additions. So definitely check it out if you're interested in that space. There's a digital press conference <clears throat> that's a little bit later this month. Um, I believe this is geared more towards communications professionals, uh, but Mike or Dave, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, this is actually just my, Microsoft does this event annually, and it's basically just them big kind of a big showing off of all of their uh, upcoming things. Uh, it's where a lot of the, some of the bigger announcements come out of. And uh, there's actually a bunch of uh, rumors about some of the stuff to come out of this one that have been kind of interesting. And uh, we could talk more about that in the uh, Drink 365 thing later today. Um, but also there's been a lot of speculation because E3 was just recently canceled that uh, a lot of the uh, Microsoft announcements that would have normally come out of E3 may be coming out of this event instead. Yeah, and just to clarify, E3 is the video game um, <clears throat> conference that usually takes place every year in LA. And rumors are they would be announcing more details about the new Xbox during that conference. Um, and of course, you can go on SharePoint using the browser on your Xbox, so this is all very relevant. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, the Microsoft Ignite conference this year, um, I don't believe they've opened registrations yet, but they do have pre-registrations open. Um, it's taking place in New Orleans this year. Um, I'm going to be there. Um, I'm not sure, Dave or Mike, if you're planning to attend, but it should be a good one. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, there is a monthly call for women IT pros. You can find more information on the link attached here. Um, so, if anyone knows of any other events, you know, please enter them into the chat. We'll gladly broadcast them. All right. <clears throat> so we have a few neighboring user groups that we always like to mention. Um, we have the Hartford Office 365 user group hosted by Jared down in Hartford. Um, definitely check them out if you're joining us from southern New England. We have the Granite State user group. Um, so Julie Turner and Jim Wilcox host that up in New Hampshire. So if you're in North Boston, definitely a great place to check out. Um, there's a few other user groups that are in the area. We have um, an Azure user group, a Power BI user group, PowerShell, as well as Link, which is then renamed to Skype, which is now Teams. Uh, but the, the point being, if you're invested in the stack, there's a lot of great communities in the area to help you uh, further your challenges and successes in that platform. Yeah, that that link slash Skype for business user group is very focused on the uh, PBX integration part, 
a lot of PBX uh, professionals and telecom communication professionals in that group. Good stuff. <clears throat> All right, so coming up next month. Um, so DRC Hess is going to be um, speaking. Um, most likely the event will also be virtual such as this event so we definitely will appreciate your feedback if, if you like the format of this event as opposed to a normal teams meeting please let us know um we are working on with the rc on finalizing what the subject is but for now we are targeting april 16th for the virtual event and just like with this event we would ask that you register on eventbrite select remote viewing and that way our automated system can get you the link to the event um about 30 to 60 minutes before the event begins. I do want to call out that Chrissy just mentioned that there is one more event coming up in May. It's the MBAS 2020 digital event. Um, and MBA <coughs> stands for Microsoft Business Application Summit. Um, so this is a great way for power users and business decision makers to be able to go in and, and see what the latest and greatest is from Microsoft. So um, regarding the this slide of any problems, tips, is anyone hiring or looking for work? Um, we have more of a social forum coming up directly after this, and Mike's going to be sharing some information on that shortly. Um, I think that would be a much better way to, to discuss things rather than the Q&A here, only because the Q&A is delayed by about 45 seconds. Agreed. It's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Oh, thanks to Backup of Five for sponsoring us last month. Um, anyway, so yes. let's get into the raffle. Um, so we have two gift cards that we're giving away, one from uh, Mike's organization, the Wallington Street Consulting, one from my organization, Turn Digital. So that being said, we're going to ask Seth to um, ask two raffle questions, and we'll ask that you reply via chat, and then the first person to reply correctly to each question um, will get a, a gift card from us. So um, Seth, <clears throat> I'm going to tee you up for question number one. Yeah. All right. So let's try this. So I'm trying to decide how if I want to make the questions really hard or really easy. I'm going to try to pick something in the middle. So. So for this, just so you're aware, I'm looking for two answers together, right? So like there are several things you could choose from. I'm looking for any two. So the question I, I, I talked about the types of things that can shape governance policies, like often you have to shape governance or people start thinking about governance because something happens that drives the behavior change. I'm looking for two examples of things that would suddenly make people think, oh, new something different governance. And uh, if you can't think of two, well, then we'll, we'll know that because no one will type anything. So <laughs> give it a try. So it's not. <laughs> You know, because my mom made me. That is, it's got to be one of the ones that uh, that I brought up. <laughs> don't have to get the don't have to get the wording exactly right. Um, and said, since we're on a, a bit of a delay, why don't we go ahead with question number two right now as well? Ooh, okay. Question number two. So while you guys are working on question one, what did I have as another question? I wanted to ask a penguin question, but I I decided not to. What did I have as another question? Uh, same kind of thing. I'm looking for two answers. There are a lot to choose from. I'm looking for someone who can give me two. Um, we talked a lot about how from a governance perspective, it might be nice to, uh, hang, on, hang on, sorry. I have to word this as a question, right? It's like Jeopardy. So give me two examples of where different local organizations or different stakeholders within the organization are likely to disagree that have to be managed or reconciled. Oh, that's a good one. All right. So we did get some answers back for the first question. Chrissy G was the fa fastest um, with the fingers. Uh, she has conflicting topics and definitions. Uh, not quite. I feel okay. guilty saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no that, that, that's fair. That, that, that's how it rolls. And then Lisa, right after. Uh, uh, I like Lisa's answer. See, so Lisa. With... Yep. So Lisa has her two answers. I see them here. So a precipitating event like COVID-19 and leadership has a new idea. I'll accept those as as answers. <clears throat> Excellent. Yes. Outside Lisa, forces please. is more uh, generic way of talking about COVID-19, so an outside force or 
right? Or an inside personality. Awesome. Excellent. And then the second question, we're still waiting for those answers to come in. Uh, two things that uh, different stakeholders are going to disagree about that need to be reconciled or managed. <laughs> I realize I might not have gotten in my light bulb joke, but I, now that I'm springing it up, it's sort of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I have a light bulb joke. Um, so, so before you do that, I think you may need to ask that second question one more time because I, I, I think that people it. were, yeah, just really thinking hard and long it on the first one. The first question. I can try one more time or we can just go with one. So let's go with one. So something where different stakeholders are going to disagree that creates a governance challenge. There you have it. How's that? It's Excellent. We saw some examples in the deck when I walked through. So I was trying to think of a light bulb joke for taxonomists. You know how many light, how many taxonomists does it take to screw in a light bulb? And I think the standard answer to that is it depends. But I don't think that's a specific taxonomy answer, and it's a bit of an inside joke. Um, so I was thinking, how many, how many light, how many taxonomists to screw in a light bulb? And I say, well, it depends. Does screwing it in change its definition? <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Is it still a light bulb? I mean, when you screw it in, is it still a light bulb? Is it a light bulb when it's not screwed in? Remember, I used the, I used the example when we last presented about you know people talk about the light being on or off, or the circuit being open or closed, yeah, the switch. switch up and down, right? And it's just, yeah, yeah. That was really cool. <laughs>